Hi, welcome back AP Biology students. Today I wanted to talk to you about some of the evidence we have for evolution. You should be able to identify examples from five separate disciplines and explain how those examples are evidence for evolution. We're also going to talk about some key terms like homologous and analogous structures and you should be able to define those as well. So the five fields we're going to talk about is the fossil record, which is probably the one you're most familiar with, embryology, anatomical structures, biogeography, like the little wombat, why is he only found in Australia, and also what I think ultimately explains everything is the biochemical examples. So the fossil record, we know what fossils are, right? So they're remains left from organisms of the past. Usually they're hard body parts, bones, shells. They can also be imprints like this um, dragonfly fly over here. They could be worm castings, footprints, mineralized droppings. But when we look at fossils over time, we can see how one organism has changed slightly over a long period of time. So not just all at once, but over a period of time. We're pretty familiar with the relative dating of sedimentary rocks. So sedimentary rock is laid down in layers, right? So it makes sense. The further down the sediments they are, they refer to the strata. The further down the strata they are, the older the rock is, and therefore the older any fossils found in that region would be. And we can date, like the Grand Canyon is a great place to date. Um, the different layers and we know whether they're from the Cretaceous period or the Silurian or the Devonian and so we're able to say that this organism lived at that time. <clears throat> Transitional fossils are also seen in the fossil record and what they are is they are fossils that look similar to two different groups of organisms um, but not entirely like one or the other. So they're believed to have been the connection between the two. And the Archaeopteryx is probably the one that is most familiar or famous um, and maybe because we found it a long time ago, right? So we've known about the Archaeopteryx for a, uh, since 1860. So this ancient bird, if you will, has similarities to the bird. It has wings and feathers and it has similarities similarities to the reptile, its jaws, its bone structure of its face and legs. And so it's believed to be the connection between those two organisms. More recently, and therefore less familiar to us, is the Tiktaalik. And the Tiktaalik has been uh, discovered just in 2004, whereas the Archaeopteryx is from the late Jurassic period. The Tiktaalik is from the Devonian period. And the Devonian period is probably when fish would have left the water and moved on to land due to the uh, regressing seas. So the Tiktaalik resembles um, a cross between a crocodile and a fish. And so it's believed to be the missing link between the sea and the land animals. So here you can see um, the Tiktaalik and it uh, was probably a bottom dweller. It used its fins or the beginnings of a leg um, for walking. So it has the beginnings of a wrist, lungs, and um, a robust set of ribs. And so that's believed to have been terrestrial. And then it has fins and gills like a fish. So probably the connection between swimming and walking. Another example um, that has to do with movement from water, land, land, water is the whale. So it's believed that the whale had a terrestrial ancestor and you can see through the fossil record how we've moved through time to get to the whale. And um, so whales descended from an ancestor that had four legs and walked on land as you can see up here at the top and um, we're going to make our way down to the ambu Locutus nadens. So this was discovered, again, this is a more recent discovery, and this would be the connection between the terrestrial and the water dwellers. So that name was given to it as it means walking whale. 
So there's lots of transitional fossils that have been found over time. These are just a couple examples. So you want to be able to explain how they show connection between two groups of organisms and therefore evidence of evolution. Another example has to do with the marsupials. So marsupials are only found in Australia. And they were once found in South America. And if you, if you remember Pangaea, the supercontinent, Australia and, North, and South America used to be connected. And then over time we had continental drift and the Pangaea broke apart. And so there were probably some marsupials left on that piece of South America as it drifted away. But placental mammals that also existed in that area were out competing the marsupials in South America. And so the numbers of the marsupials began to decline because they no longer had the variation that was advantageous in that area. Anatomical evidence is another example of homology. So homology is referring to similarities. So we can look at similarities in structure. And here's where we talk about homologous and vestigial structures. So those two both explain um, common ancestry. So like this, these human, dog, bird, whale, they all have the same basic bone structure, right? They have um, a humerus, an ulna, a radius, carpals, metacarpals. And they're really arranged pretty much in the same pattern. So think back to DNA, right? DNA codes for traits. If we have similar traits, doesn't it make sense we have similar DNA? And we know DNA is passed on from generation to generation. So if we have similar DNA, we must have a similar common ancestor. Ultimately, with evolution, if things are similar, pretty much they're related, right? And the less similar they are, the more distant related they are or the less related they are. Um, so this is an example of divergent evolution. So divergent evolution, organisms start as one, and then as they adapt to their own environments, their different environmental stresses, their way of life, different adaptations become advantageous to them, and so they begin their own pathway, which is what happened with uh, the vertebrates. So we were just looking at examples of vertebrates where we have all the same um, bone structure, but we use our bones for different purposes. So flying, swimming, running, swinging from a tree even. So homologous structures have the same structure and therefore a similar DNA. They have different functions. So if we have the same DNA, again, we had to have gotten it from a common ancestor. And then embryonic development goes right along with that. We have similar structures and therefore similar DNA. Um, many of our um, structures exist in the embryonic form that don't exist in the adult form. So in the embryonic form, um, all vertebrates look very similar and the earlier in the development, the more similar we will look. So all vertebrates have a post-anal tail down here and we have these pharyngeal pharyngeal slits up here. So pharyngeal, so pharynx refers to throat. So in the humans, um, these pharyngeal pouches became mostly things related to our throat, our jaw, our um, tonsils, our thyroid, and in fish, they became their um, gills. So again, in order for us to have similar features, DNA codes for traits, we must have similar DNA. This is a more recent discovery, the homeobox. It's a set of Hox genes. And Hox genes, um, now we can get into like gene regulation, one of my favorite things. Um, Hox genes code for regulatory proteins. So they turn on genes at different points in the embryonic development. So in three stages, the first stage um, determines the cranio-caudial axis. So cranial refers to head and caudial refers to tail. So um, from top to bottom, from front to back, however you want to look at it, from head to tail, it determines what's the front, what's the back. And then during the second stage, it uh, segments the body. So you can see segmentation both here and here and the color code 
that identifies um, how each of these segments are determined. So it's determining the thorax, the abdomen, um, the tail region. So we all share this common Hox gene, which means we share a common ancestor. Now what's different between us is the number of Hox genes that we have in common. So this is showing you three common genes that exist between Drosophila, the fruit fly, and the mouse and the human. So at this stage you can't tell the difference between a mouse and a human. Vestigial structures give another example of descent from a common ancestor. So vestigial structures are structures that have decreased in size due to disuse. We'll look at this example of two different uh, species of snakes. So this is a very old snake from the Cretaceous period, and this is a python. So here you can see a hind leg in this fossil of the snake. And over here you can see, especially if you zoom in, little tiny nubbins of a leg that are found in the python. So that would be an example of a vestigial structure. Perhaps back in the Cretaceous period, that leg had a purpose. And now we know today that pythons don't have legs, they don't walk, um, so it doesn't have a purpose, so it's been decreased in size. More common examples of uh, the vestigial structure is the kiwi's wings. So the kiwi has very tiny wings, um, so it is definitely related to its birds, but it cannot fly. And then, of course, the human tailbone is an example of a vestigial structure. As it's very tiny, our common ancestor must have at one time had a tail for us to have the remnants of a tail still today. Other examples in the human of vestigial structures are wisdom teeth. Clearly, they don't serve a purpose because many of you have your wisdom teeth pulled out. I didn't even develop a couple of my wisdom teeth, so they're never in my gum line at all. Um, so they have diminished over time, and maybe our common ancestors needed to use them. Um, your appendix is another example of a vestigial structure. Whales don't walk, but as we talked about, perhaps they once did. They had a terrestrial ancestor. So here's the um, remnants of that in that it has a pelvic girdle. And pelvic girdles on us attach our legs, right? So this must be the remnants of um, a common ancestor that was once a walking organism. Um, so it has the pelvic girdle, but it has no legs. Analogous structures are the exact opposite of homologous structures. So homologous structures were same structure, different function. Analogous structures are different structures, but same function. So this is due to convergent evolution. Two very different organisms had to survive the same environmental stresses, led a similar way of life, and therefore had a common way of solving a similar problem. So the wings on the insect and the wings on the bird, for example, very similar in appearance. On the outside they look the same, but on the inside we know insects do not have bones, right? So they clearly don't have the same structure. Another example of an analogous structure is the fin of the shark and the fin of the dolphin. So the shark is a cartilaginous fish and the dolphin is a mammal. Clearly not related. Inside their structures are a little similar and they do serve the same purpose. Um, but the, you can tell the orientation and, uh, and arrangement of these structures is very different inside. So they look similar on the outside, but very different on the inside. The opposite of homologous structures, like these two wings over here, they have the same bone structure, so they're homologous. And these two fins over here, again, have the same pattern, the same arrangement of those bones, so those two are homologous. So they would be related. Like I said, it all comes down to the biochemical evidence. We all have DNA, RNA, and ATP. DNA contains genes. Genes code for proteins. Proteins are expressed as traits. The more similar our traits are, the more common our DNA must be. The genetic code is universal. We all have the same four A, T, C, and G bases. They are copied, transcribed, translated into the same 20 amino acids in every species. That explains why we're able to take genes from one organism, insert them into another, and that organism is made to express the genes. 
since DNA is universal, we're able to look at the sequence of DNA in different proteins to determine how closely related two organisms are or how recent they share a common ancestor. So cytochrome C is one of the uh, proteins we commonly use because it has been highly conserved through evolutionary time. Cytochrome C, if you remember, is part of the cellular respiration electron transport chain. All aerobic organisms use it to make ATP. We use ATP for energy for all our cellular processes. So doesn't it make sense that this is a protein that all organisms would need? So I can look at how similar our genetic code is. So over here, um, these are all comparing cytochrome C of different organisms to the human. So how different are they? So the chimpanzee has no differences whatsoever in its genetic code for cytochrome C as the human. They are identical. So we share a very recent common ancestor. The rhesus monkey were a little more distant to them because they have one difference. If I continue down, I can see nine differences between us and the rabbit and 37 differences between us and wheat germ. So we don't have as close a degree of kinship, how closely related we are, to the wheat germ as we do to the rabbit, which definitely makes sense since the rabbit is not only a vertebrate but also a mammal. So we already know that we're related to them. Another common example used is hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is used to carry oxygen in the blood, right? So again, we use oxygen for cellular respiration and therefore to make ATP and energy. So it would once again make sense that we all need hemoglobin in one form or the other. So again, looking at the number of differences, uh, there's one difference between the human and the gorilla. There's eight differences between the human and the rhesus monkey. So whereas we only had one difference in the cytochrome C, we have eight differences in our hemoglobin. So that tells us we have a more recent ancestor with the gorilla than we do with the rhesus monkey. And you can continue on all the way down to the soybean. So the less differences that are exhibited, the more closely related two organisms are. So we talked about five lines of evidence for evolution you should be able to give a claim evidence and reasoning. The fossil record shows evidence of evolution. What's the evidence? You need to be able to explain that. What's the reasoning? Why is that an example of evidence for evolution? So for each of these five lines, um, you could make a practice FRQ, um, use a CER. That should prepare you to answer any questions related to um, evidence of evolution in a multiple choice question, as well as be able to talk about two or three of these in an FRQ. So I hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching.